Hi. Um, good morning and afternoon to everyone. Um, so I, I, most of you are quite familiar with the program, so I'll just do this uh, very rapidly. Um, it, this is locating this exercise within the program. The We Care program uh, aims to give women more choice over time use by reducing and redistributing unpaid care work. And so we are uh, implementing uh, infrastructure and time and labor saving equipment to reduce the time required for household tasks and uh, influencing to ensure that responsibility for care is shared more equally. And part of this is challenging social norms that hold women responsible for care and the norms that uh, belittle and undervalue care work. And what we've seen is that um, we get sustainable change when we combine these two areas. Um, we Care has done in the Philippines and other countries um, IEC communications activities that raise awareness that unpaid care work is significant and important or that heavy and unequal care work is a problem. And this awareness raising is good, um, but we understand now that it's really not enough, that we need to go beyond that to um, identify people's beliefs and perceptions and attitudes more in a more detailed way and then uh, what types of communications and, actu and activities can actually shift these beliefs and perceptions and attitudes. So that's why we're doing this exercise. Um, what we found with our research evidence is that social norms are very powerful. Um, that even when people have individual preferences about doing their behavior differently on care, even when you have equipment and infrastructure, norms are blocking change. And um, it, we care pro program participants often do recognize the value of care work from being part of the program, but then change isn't really automatic because um, the norms are sticky. We need to f and identify which norms are sticky. We need to explicitly and intentionally promote change where there are opportunities, um, and we need to identify if there are any negative norms that we can successfully challenge. Um, so this exercise is designed to generate findings that will then help a project develop priorities about which social norms to address in a particular uh, district or, or locality. Um, so we're not trying to address all the norms. We're trying to be focused and explicit and intentional. We're carrying out activities at a district level uh, so that uh, local communities get a relatively um, intensive experience of an exposure to the various activities and materials and then we can really monitor and evaluate change through the baseline and endline research. Now in addition to this um, we will do mass communications and aware, awareness raising at uh, provincial or national level, radio, Ministry of Health, um, and these findings are going to be um, an input to some of uh, the design of those um, massive communications. Um, but but it's really different than the very uh, focused um, communication or sorry awareness focus social norms activities that we want to do at a local level. Um, we also are doing influencing, influencing change with ministries, um, health, education, other things, sharing whatever is really striking about our findings um, so that uh, they can um, know better how to do their own communications. So. Um, these next two slides are the focus group discussion proposal. Um, the purpose is data gathering, and as far as we know, this hasn't been done before. Um, and we'll do the focus groups uh, with a new methodology, with a script that um, some of you have received today or last night. 
um, and very set questions. And that will give a consistency to the focus group discussion data gathering um, across Zimbabwe and the Philippines. We're proposing doing five to seven focus group discussions uh, with uh, mixed sex groups, male only and female only. And the piloting that we'll do will test uh, the difference in findings and the discussions when you have a mixed group or a single sex group. Um, as is often true with developing a research, new research methodology, this is going to be a process with several steps. Um, we started with a proposed script that had several consultations with some of you perhaps over to the last couple months and we uh, consulted externally as well as internally to try to get a good script. Uh, in the next couple weeks we'll have piloting of this script in the Philippines and Zimbabwe and then debriefing with Emma, uh, improve the script and then implement the focus groups discussions five to seven in um, each of the countries with a consistent means of recording the finding and then we'll um, write up the results. Um, the findings that we'll get are mostly quotes from participants and this data needs to be protected. So you, as you may have seen in the script document there's a very thorough process of obtaining consent um, and the the other thing we're doing to protect people is that each participant will sign the consent form but then um, give their age, gender, education, marital status and occupation on a form which has a number and the name tags will then have numbers only so that the recorder, the documenter, will say number two said this and then we would be able to put in a report that number two was a female of this age with this education and this type of um, household. Um, and uh, for the mixed groups we'll have odd number tags, even the tags um, to be able to um, um, mix up the groups. Okay, so and uh, the the last part of the uh, overall proposal is that for mixed groups we suggest uh, to having a few more uh, women than men. Um, we aim for a variation in age, younger and older people, um, and a variation in education or marital status or uh, the, the relative wealth of the participants in that community. Um, it is a one full session at the beginning of focus group discussion and then um, the, the next six exercises are three sets of two exercises that are conducted in parallel um, and then the, each of the groups feedback um, following each split session. Uh, so the parallel sections, uh, sessions will mix up the participants based on their numbers. Um, so that's the overall proposal. Um, and any questions? Back to Imogen. Thanks, Celia. So I'm going to hand over to you now um, to type any questions you have um, in the questions or chat box. Um, any, any questions you have for Thalia about um, what... <laughs> I'm sorry, Thalia is just going to head off now. So any questions you have um, on what Thalia just said that Emma and I will be able to answer. Um, so while um, you're writing those down, I'm just going to read out some of the introductions. Um, so Anna Giolito, We Care Program Manager, um, Ferdinand Derequito, um, Meal Coordinator in the Philippines, Anna Maria Caspe, um, Oxfam's Pro um, Partnership Relations Manager in Mindanao. Um, we also have Genevieve, Supporting Communications and Knowledge Management, um, and Rhoda Avila, who is the Policy Research and Campaigns Advisor for the Philippine Country Program. Um, so, we have our first question through from um, Anna, Anna Maria Caspe, um, and she's asking whether there's a target date for the completion of the focus group discussion. So, I'm going to hand over to Emma for that question, because um, I think she's um, more aware of the timelines than I am. Um, so, Emma, um, do you know the answer to that question? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't entirely. From from what I have understood, the 
focus groups um, should take place within the first half of August, but I'm afraid the part I don't know that we'll need to check with Dahlia is, uh, sorry, the pilot focus groups are due to take place the first half of August, but what we'll need to check is what is the schedule for completing the, the full focus groups. So perhaps we can check that when, when Thalia returns. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, the, so this was my um, understanding as well, that the tests will be in the first half of August. Um, and we just had a response from Anna Giolito as well, saying that the test um, will be by the first half of August and the focus group discussions will be completed by mid-September. So thanks, Anna, for that response. Um, are there any other questions before we move on to Emma's part? There'll also be um, space to ask questions after Emma's presentation later as well. Um, so, okay, I think um, I think in that case we'll um, we'll move on to Emma's presentation. If there are any questions that occur to you during her presentation, just type them in, and we can come back to them um, after she's presented. So, I think for Emma's presentation, um, please could you open the script which I sent out to you yesterday because she'll be um, referring back to that throughout the presentation. I've also just seen that we've been joined by Leia. Um, which is really great news, um, so welcome Leia, and you've joined at a good point because we're just about to get into the detail of the um, focus group discussion, so um, I will hand over to Emma now. Okay, thank you Imogen, and thanks to, to all of you who have commented on the script so far, so I hope that the latest version will reflect the comments and suggestions that, that you've given. Let me first just say something a little bit further about this structure of the focus groups, building on what, what Thalia has, has just described. <coughs> Excuse me. So as she mentioned, the exercises themselves are divided into two parts. We propose a 30 minute break in between. And overall, we hope that it should take around four hours. So we'll be very interested to hear from you following the piloting as, as to how long it takes in practice. The first part of the discussion is focused on identifying the norms. So this will consist of one exercise involving the full group, followed by a parallel session in which the group is uh, split in half. And each half of the group then will undertake a separate exercise. So there'll be two exercises going on at once. Following that parallel session, we suggest that the group reconvene. Given time constraints, rather than going through a full debriefing, we suggest that the facilitator spend about 10 minutes to highlight and get reactions to the most surprising findings that arose in, in each of the discussions. The second part then is designed to explore the potential for change. And this, again, for reasons of timing, will involve two parallel sessions, each of which will be followed by 10 minute sessions in which the the full group reconvenes. So let's go through each of these two parts in turn. Uh, I'll speak for no more than 20 minutes on the first part, then, then let's take some, we'll go through some questions and then go through the second part. So next slide, please. So the first part, the part that's focused on identifying norms, has consists of three exercises which are focused on identifying the norms that shape the household division of labor and then exploring how they are reflected both in economic norms, so here meant as beliefs around care tasks and around productive activities, and also in sayings and proverbs around the household division of labor. And so we'll look at each of these three exercises more closely. What I'd like to do is to highlight some of the key elements of each, so the aim, the focus, then go over the questions in the actual script, which, which hopefully you'll have in front of you, and then describe the key outputs that we envision as coming out of the exercise, and highlight, and I'll highlight any particular points to note with each. Next slide, please. So let's begin first with the household division of labor, the first exercise. The aim here is to begin by understanding how labor is divided within a typical household in the, the communities where the discussions will take place, how participants explain this, and any appetite that they express for change. So the rationale here is that understanding the current state of affairs and how much uh, 
change participants desire is a necessary precondition for effective programming. So as mentioned, this session involves the full group and it's one of the longer sessions. It's designed to last about 50 minutes. The focus is what a typical household would uh, would look like, the roles and responsibilities of each of its members, the reasons for and the consequences of the current division of labor, and whether a different division of labor would be preferred. So if you could please turn to the script now, uh, we can go through the questions in more detail. First of all, to set up the exercise, we propose that the facilitator asks the participants to imagine what a typical household in the village or, or the community might look like. And I would like to note here that this exercise is deliberately worded so as not to focus on roles related to gender roles, but, excuse me, not to focus on roles related to gender, but rather to capture any differences that the community members identify as important in, in shaping the division of labor. The, we'll address the gender roles more explicitly in some of the later exercises. So the exercise opens with the facilitator, the facilitator saying to the group, first, I'd like to talk about a very typical household that might live in this community. Let's assume that there are two adults called Anna and Adam. And these, of course, should be replaced with, with more typical names for, for the community. Uh, and then, what is the relationship of, of Anna and Adam to one another? And how old are they? So the facilitator here should explain that, that Anna and Adam may be a couple, or they could be any other, uh, they could have any other relationship. They, they could be a sister and a brother, or perhaps if the mother has migrated, the father and an adult daughter or perhaps if it's a single mother, then, then a mother and her son or her father. So the, the point here though is that this need not necessarily be a, a couple. The group is free to decide on the relationship between them. So once the relationship of Anna and Adam is established in their approximate ages, the facilitator should then ask the group to identify who else lives in this, this typical household. So are there any children? If so, how many? How old are they? Who else lives with them, or if anyone? Are there any older people? Any other relatives? Any domestic workers? So the types of questions may vary a little bit depending on the context, but the idea is, is to enumerate all of the members of this hypothetical household. And we suggest that it might be helpful at this stage for the facilitator to draw images to illustrate the various household members and to write their name, their, excuse me, their age next to each so that the participants keep this information in mind. Once this household is established, the facilitator then goes on to ask about how work is divided amongst its various members. And here to Again, to avoid any immediate focus on gender roles, we suggest starting with the youngest member of the family and then working, working up from the youngest member to the oldest. So the facilitator would then ask, I'd like to understand better the roles and responsibilities of each of these members. Thinking about all the activities that take place in this household, what tasks is, and then starting with the youngest person, is that person responsible for? And for any children named, it would be useful to ask from, from what age they began doing the tasks that they, they, they are carrying out. So one point that has emerged here uh, in discussions with the team in Zimbabwe is, is if any tasks that may be identified as shared tasks. And here we suggest the facilitator ask additional questions if a task is, is identified as shared to probe what sharing means in that specific case. So whether it means that the tasks are shared equally or done together, or rather it is that one person does it usually and sometimes someone else helps. So once this list of tasks for each household member is established, the facilitator should then probe the reasons for and the consequences of this division of labor. And this is reflected in the next two questions. So one B is, tell me more about why work is divided in this way within households in this community. 1C, what are some of the consequences of how work is, how this work is divided for different people in the household? And again, the suggestion to go through the different names. 
And finally, the facilitator asks about any desire for change, and if there's any, what kind of what type of changes would be preferred? So one D is, do you think there should be a different division of work within households in this community? If yes, why? What would this division of responsibilities look like? And if no, then then why not? And then finally, for single sex groups, what would you do if you had an extra hour each day? What would be the benefits? So. This is a way of probing the extent to which extra time would be spent on care-related tasks and could be useful in terms of, of tracking changes over time. Next slide, please. So the key outputs that we envision emerging from this exercise would be a list of responsibilities of each member of the hypothetical household, a list of reasons for the current household division of labor for different household members, and a description of what a desirable household division of labor would look like if, if this differs from, from what exists at present. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to note once more that the key here will be to avoid biasing this discussion by assuming that the household needs to consist of an adult couple and their children to be open to whatever type of household the group decides upon and particularly to, to avoid a focus on gender roles in order to see what differences the participants themselves think are important. And again, this is why when we, we go through the roster of household members, we suggest doing so in, in terms of age. Next slide, please. So let me turn now to the second exercise focused on economic norms. This also deliberately avoids a focus on gender. It is designed to understand better why some tasks are perceived differently for, from others. So care-related tasks on the one hand and productive or income-generating tasks on the other. So in particular, it builds upon results in the household care survey, which suggested that people typically viewed productive or income-generating tasks, such as building a house or selling products, as requiring more skill and being more valuable than care-related tasks, such as looking after people or washing clothes. So the exercise aims to learn more it is about why some tasks are seen as more skilled or more valuable than others. Again, to help design programming, which in this case highlights the skill and value embodied in care-related tasks, and perhaps challenges the view that productive or income-generating tasks are more skilled and valuable. So this exercise will involve half of the focus group participants. The, the script itself contains details of how this group can be, can be split using the numbers that, that Thelia mentioned. And it's designed to last about 35 minutes. So if you could turn to this script, please, and we can go through what's proposed in more detail. We suggest that the facilitator begin by sharing with the group cards which de depict 12 activities. And these are tasks that were asked about in the household care survey and the cards themselves are provided in the appendix to the script. So the cards list the following activities, meal preparation, planting or harvesting of crops, cleaning the house or compounds, drying or processing an agricultural product, caring for children, carpentry or making furniture, caring for elderly, ill or disabled people, house construction or repair, fuel or water collection, selling products or trading, taking care of farm animals, and washing, ironing, or mending clothes. So we've structured this so that the group first thinks about the value and skill that they attach to the different tasks as enumerated in the, or as listed in the cards, and then reflects on the results that emerged from the household care survey. So the idea is that the facilitator would first ask the group to look at the cards and identify the two or three activities that require the most skill and the two or three that require the least skill so that they're, they're going through the process that people went through in the larger survey. And the same process is repeated for, for value. And then the results of the, the household care survey themselves are shared. So this would consist of two lists with the 12 tasks ranked from most to least valuable and from most to least skilled, respectively. Here, the facilitator should explain that these lists reflect how a larger number of people in the community rank the same activities. And they are asked whether or not they agree with the ranking. 
Then the facilitator turns to the reasons for the ranking on the basis of the results. So why is it that people think that, for example, household, excuse me, uh, housework requires fewer skills than making furniture, or taking care of older people is less valuable than selling goods at the market. Next slide, please. So the envisioned outputs here are a list of reasons that some tasks are perceived as relatively more or less skilled, and, a, and of reasons that some tasks are perceived uh, as relatively more or less valued. Finally, uh, a note on piloting. It's been suggested that the concept of value might not translate neatly into other languages, and so it could be important to prove how this is understood. Next slide, please. So I'll turn now to the third exercise, which focuses on sayings and proverbs around the work that women do and men do. So this is the first exercise in which gender roles are explicitly introduced. And the rationale is that understanding these sayings and proverbs and knowing why it is they resonate and with whom within the community can help in developing influential messaging excuse me, around the household division of work. Again, this exercise is designed to involve half of the participants and to take around 35 minutes. So let's turn to the actual exercise in the script. The facilitator first asks the group to come up with sayings or proverbs in their community around what good women or mothers or wives do and don't do, and, to, and about sayings about what good men or uh, fathers or husbands do or don't do. We then propose introducing the table of sayings or proverbs from the rapid care analysis, which address this subject in much more depth, and asking the participants to reflect on this and how it matches with the sayings that, that uh, they have come up with. So much like the exercise on economic norms started with an activity amongst the participants and then presented the findings from the household care survey, here we propose uh, again an exercise amongst the participants to come up with sayings or proverbs and then anchoring this in the table of sayings and proverbs that came up in the, in the more in-depth exercise on the same theme. So the idea by having these, these two uh, exercises, the participants and then the, the rapid care analysis results, that the facilitators should be able to try and make this list as complete as possible, uh, and also to identify which sayings are more and less current, and, and to identify any that may be somewhat out of date. So the script goes on to say, are any sayings missing? Are any out of date or becoming less relevant? What about new sayings? Are these included here? And then 3C, which sayings do you think resonate with people the most? Tell me why this is. Who do you think agrees and disagrees with the most influential sayings? And here the idea is to pick one or two sayings that are identified as being uh, most influential in order to guide the discussion. And so, next slide please. The output that we would envision here is a list of influential sayings with details of why they resonate and for whom. And in particular, we propose emphasizing any sayings that might have any comic or visual elements which could be used in any future communications activity. Now, following the, these three exercises, so the first group session and the second parallel session, we then propose that the group takes a half hour break. And let's, let's go now to, to questions before we go on to the second half of the script, which is focused on processes of change. So thank you for, for your attention. Thanks a lot, Emma. Um, so, if you have any questions on what Emma has just presented, then please do write in your questions in the chat box or in the questions box. Um, we have a question from Leia um, saying, asking for the cards, will we be printing it here or do you have sample pictures already for us to print? So I think this is referring to the exercise um, with the ranking of different activities and I believe those are in an annex. Um, right, if you scroll down right to the end of the script then um, you should find an annex for um, cards with types of work for exercises two and four. Um, so um, you can print those out yourselves or obviously if you have um, 
more relevant pictures um, to your context or um, you want to use different cards then you're welcome to but otherwise um, we do have those uh, ready-made for you in the annex of the script um, and then um, someone's also I think either Genevieve or Ferdinand has said um, we still have six sets of laminated cards from the household care survey that you'll be able to use um, and recycle for this activity um, and they has just asked whether we can use our local context pictures so yes and um, please feel free to use whichever's um, whichever photos or pictures are the most relevant um, to your context and if you already have those left over from the household care survey then um, then that would seem to make sense um, I'm just checking whether there are any other questions. Um, there aren't any at the moment, but please do write them in if you have any. Um, I don't Emma, if you have anything else to add on what I just um, elaborated on for the activities, um, whether these specific activities um, have to be used um, to make sure that um, it's consistent across the, um, the Philippines and Zimbabwe, or whether there's any um, flexibility there. Thanks, Imogen. I, I think that in the first part of the exercise, it's it's fine to to introduce cards that have context specific images. Now, of course, the the um, group will then be asked to reflect upon the results that came from the household care survey. Uh, but I would imagine there wouldn't be huge differences between the two. That that perhaps the context specific images would be used to illustrate some of the the activities which are described in the list. If that's not the case, then then perhaps we should discuss. But I would I would yeah, I would imagine that, that most of the the context specific ones would would match the the uh, proposed index cards in in some sense. Thanks, Emma. Um, there don't seem to be any other questions, so. I think we can move on to the second part of your presentation, which goes into the um, the following um, exercises during the focus group discussion. And uh, if there are any questions again that occur to you that you um, didn't get a chance to ask, then please do write them down as we go along. Okay, thank you. So let's turn now to part two of the script, which is focused on exploring the potential for change. So in this part, as mentioned, there will be two parallel sessions, each of which involves two exercises. In the first session, the group will focus on the willingness of men to adopt new care roles and on uh, women to adopt new productive or income generating roles and any changes that have occurred in the household division of labor over time, respectively. While in the second session, the groups will focus either on compelling ways of sharing messaging around care and on aspirations for young people in terms of the household division of labor. So aspirations for young people once they uh, grow older and set up their own, their own households. And again, each of the two sessions, the two parallel sessions will be separated by 10 minutes in which the full group reconvenes for feedback and discussion on each of the exercises. So let's turn now to exercise four, which is focused on the willingness to adopt new care roles. The rationale for this is to identify tasks and roles where change is possible, to avoid efforts to promote change where resistance may be high, and to address any backlash that could arise in the process of norms change, so to ensure that that is, is minimized. This exercise will involve half of the participants and it's envisioned to take about 50 minutes. So this will focus on which care-related tasks participants feel it's more acceptable to do and less acceptable and why this is. So care-related tasks that participants feel it's more and less acceptable for men to do and why this is, excuse me. And conversely, which productive tasks are more acceptable for women to do and not to do and why this is the case. And it will also explore more concretely whether any men in the community are taking on more domestic or care work, how they are perceived and any potential risks associated with the change. And we will look at potential risks both for men taking on more care work and 
for women who, who may do less care work. So let's go back to the script and look at the specific questions that are proposed. And here the starting point is a list of care-related activities that women carry out typically and the productive or income-generating activities that men typically carry out. What we would suggest is that the facilitator produce these two lists over the break and this could draw on the tasks that are identified in the first exercise which opened with the Anna Adam vignette. Uh, and this could be potentially supplemented by the tasks on the index cards that will be used in the economic norms uh, index. So the idea would be to have a list of, of care related tasks that women typically do and market or income generating tasks that, that men uh, typically do on this basis. So the facilitator then first takes lists of care related activities and asks the group, and this is question 4a, which of these care related tasks would men be most open to doing? Is it possible to order them on the basis of uh, which men would be most and least open to doing? Then with the list of productive or income generating activities, the facilitator asks, which of these activities would women be most open to doing? Is it possible to order them on the basis of which women would be most and least open to doing? So then one list is produced in which care activities are ranked from most to least acceptable for men and another in which productive activities are ranked from most to least acceptable for women. Once this list is complete, the facilitator then probes the underlying reasons for the rankings that have emerged. So asking for each task, why have you given it this ranking? Why is, for example, looking after a child more acceptable for a man than washing clothes? Or why is planting crops more acceptable for a woman than building a house? If the group is unable to rank any of the tasks, then it would also be useful to probe why this is the case. So then the discussion turns to actual circumstances within the community. The next question for C is, do you know of any households in this community where men or boys take on more household tasks or care and or care responsibilities? And if so, what types of household or care responsibilities do they do? What are these households like? What do people think about this? Why is that? And if not, what do you think would happen if they did? So if men took on more household or care responsibilities. Then turning to women, questions 4D and 4E. Do you know of any women or girls in this community who do not do the household or care work that is expected of them? Tell me more about these households. And then if a woman does not do the household or care work that is expected of her, what would happen? What would people think about her? What about if a girl did not do the household or care work that was expected of her? What would happen? What would people think about this? Here, if any type of criticism or sanctioning or shunning is mentioned, it would be useful to follow up this up with questions like, how could this have been prevented? Who could get involved to change people's minds about this? Next slide, please. So what we would envision here is, the, as the outputs for this exercise, are a list of care activities ranked by their perceived acceptability for men, and a list of productive activities which are ranked by their perceived acceptability for women, as well as details of men in the community who are undertaking more care and how this is perceived, and any details of sanctions against women who may be doing less care work. Finally, just to note again that this will involve a little bit of preparation prior to the exercise to make the lists that will be discussed in the initial part. So let's turn now to the fifth exercise, the focus of which is understanding changes that have occurred over time. And here the rationale, of course, is that understanding these changes and what prompted them will again help to inform effective programming. This exercise will involve half of the participants. Again, it's, it's aimed to take about 50 minutes, so the same as the previous exercise. And the focus will be on what changes have taken place in the household division of labor, which could be either permanent shifts or, or perhaps temporary shifts owing to very specific circumstances. So the questions aim to elicit what factors have prompted the shifts and what makes some shifts long lasting and others prone to reversals. So let's go back to the script and take a look at the questions. 
The focus first is on the more permanent shifts. So the facilitator asks in 5A, has the actual division of tasks between men and women changed over time? For example, have women started to do more productive market or income generating activities? Have men started to take on more domestic or cat care tasks in their homes? If there has been change, then the facilitator should probe further into why the, what, what happened and why. So what has happened? When did this happen? Why did the division of tasks change? Did new equipment become available? New services? Did men or women start doing different paid work? Did something else change? Followed by, tell me about the effects of this change. And here the, facilita the facilitator could probe for men, for women, for boys, for girls, to get a full understanding of that. And if there have not been any changes that the participants identify, then why do you think things have not changed? What are your views or feelings on this lack of change? Then in the next question, the script turns to any temporary changes that participants can identify. So 5B, are there any times of the year, for example, seasons or exceptional circumstances, for example, pregnancy or childbirth, perhaps migration, drought or flood or economic need? This list can, of course, be customized to, to local circumstances. But are there any exceptional circumstances which can bring about changes in care roles and or the productive market or income generating activities that women and men do in this community, even if only temporarily? For example, if a woman is pregnant, would a man take on more household or care work? Or if there is an economic need, might a woman take on paid work? If there are any changes identified, the script then goes on to ask what are events or circumstances that have brought about change? So what does this change look like? How are the tasks that men, boys, and girls, women do affected? What are the effects of this change here, for, again, for women, for men, for boys, for girls? What do people in this community think about this change? And then how long does this change last? Do things go back to as they were, or is there some longer term change. And then finally, are there people or groups that you know of who are trying to change the task, the way that tasks are divided between men and women in this community? Tell me more about them. Does their opinion carry weight? Why or why not? Next slide, please. So here are the outputs that we would envision are descriptions of any permanent or temporary shifts that, that have occurred. Uh, as well as what caused them and what led to any reversals in terms of the temporary shifts. And just here, as, as I have already noted, that some prompts may be needed to uncover the causes of temporary shifts, which could, could be formulated depending on, on, the local, on local circumstances again. So let's turn to the next exercise, the penult penultimate one, which is focused on compelling ways of sharing messages. Here, the rationale is that the programming that, that will result uh, in part from, from these exercises will seek to communicate new messages. And so it will be vital to know who it is that people are listening to and why and who they trust the most. So this is a shorter exercise. We anticipate that it will take about 35 minutes. Again, it involves half of the participants. Its focus is on which people in the community are perceived as the most effective messengers or role models if any of these messengers or role models exhibit a more progressive distribution of household work? And what are the most trusted sources of information within the community? So let's turn to the specific questions in the script. First, 6A, who is it that people listen to and follow in this community? Who do they respect? And the facilitator here can introduce various probes. So what about community leaders or traditional leaders? local government officials such as school heads or others, religious figures, celebrities, who else? So this list, of course, can be, again, customized depending on, on, circum on the context. And then what about young women and men in this community? Who do they admire? Then 6B, do you know of any men that people look up to who have taken on household tasks or care activities that are typically done by women? Why are they respected? What do people think of the women in that household? 
then succeed. Do you know of any women that people look up to who have taken on productive market or income generating activities that are typically done by men? Why are they respected? What do people think of the men in that household? Then moving on to sources of information, 6D. What about TV or radio programs? Are there any male characters that you can think of who are taking on household tasks or looking after people? What do people think about them? And finally, 6E, what are the main ways that people get information in this community? And probes could include radio, TV shows, mobile phones or social media, perhaps community theater. What, which would you say are the most important in sources of information? Which are the least important? Which do people trust the most? Again, what about young people? Next slide, please. The outcomes that we would envision here are a list of messengers highlighting any who already dis exhibit a progressive distribution of household work and a list of trusted information sources. Here we add the suggestion that the, that the facilitator ask participants to think about potential messengers or role models both within their communities but also more widely. For example, people they see on TV or hear on the radio. Now, finally, let's turn to the seventh exercise, the last exercise, which is focused on aspirations for young people in the community. Here, the aim is to revisit what changes in care roles participants perceive as desirable for young people and the practical actions they think would be needed to make this happen. Again, this, is, this will involve half of the group and it will take about 35 minutes, so the same as the previous exercise. The <coughs> Excuse me. The, this exercise is again framed as a vignette, as was the opening exercise, uh, except in this case the focus is on two younger people in the community and what people envision as the role and responsibilities they'd like them to take on and what would need to happen for these changes to be realized. So if we revert to the script, it opens with, I'm going to talk about two typical children in this community. Let's call them David and Diana. Again, of course, these names will need to be changed to be, to be typical for the community. Let's assume that in a few years' time, David and Diana will be married with their own children. And again, the facilitator could ask if anyone else will be living in that household to get, to get a fuller sense of what that household may, might look like. And as with the opening exercise, it could be useful to draw illustrations of the various household members so that they're they're born in mind. The facilitator then asks 7a, how would you like to see David and Diana divide productive market or income generating tasks and household chores or caring for children and others? Would you like this to be dif different from how things are today? Why or why not? And then 7b, if a new division of labor is proposed, for this new division to be realized, what do you think young men like David will need to know how to do as adults? What should be done now in order to make this happen? What about young women like Diana? What will they need to know how to do? What should be done now for this to happen? Next slide, please. The outputs that we would propose from this exercise are a list of desired responsibilities for young men and for young women, and a list of the steps that could be taken in the immediate future to realize this vision, so pertaining to, to both young men and to young women. And here we note that when participants list desired roles and responsibilities, it could be useful to note any differences that emerge between caring and other household tasks. For example, if people believe that men should be more involved in care work, for example, do they confine this to activities such as, as care of children and older people, or does it extend as well to domestic tasks such as cooking or laundry? So with that, we, we reach the conclusion of the exercise. We, in the script, we have a, a short uh, section which which gives some suggestions for thanking the participants and, and asking for their feedback on the discussion and describing how the results will be shared uh, back with the community. And so, yes, with that, I've reached the, the end. So thank you for bearing with me through this detailed explanation. And let's uh, go back to any questions that you might have. Thanks a lot, Emma. We have some questions that have already come through. Uh, so 
I'll start with the first one, um, I think they're all from Leia. Um, so she's got a very specific question about 4D, um, and f 4D is where it says, do you know of any women or girls in this community who do not do the household or care work that is expected of them in this community? Tell me more about these households. And so Leia wants to know, um, do we have top line guidelines on what specific info we're asking for in this question? Okay, thank you. Uh, the idea here is to understand a bit better, first of all, if, if there are any women or girls who are not doing household or care tasks. So uh, to understand already if there's any uh, movement away from norms around the household division of labor. Uh, and then to, if, if that is the case, to understand a little bit more about if there are any particular characteristics of, of these households. So why, why is it that they have uh, a different division of labor if there's anything that can be generalized. Um, and then to understand a little bit more about what happens either in, you know, if there are such households, how, how do people react to them? Or if there is not, how would people react if girls or women decided to do less housework? With the idea of trying to understand in more detail if, if there would be any negative reactions to this and what what they might be in order that programming can be designed with a view to minimizing any types of backlash or, or uh, risks that, that might emerge. So it, again, it's, it's supposed to establish if there are any households where already there is a different division of labor and what's, what these households look like. And then even if there are not, uh, what would happen in, in the event that a woman did not do uh, the care or household work that was expected. Does that, does that make things clearer? Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, Leia said, she, she said that she's understood your response, so thanks a lot for that. Um, okay, so um, a couple of other questions. Um, so Leia's asked us to send her the PowerPoint presentation, which we can do. Um, so um, another question about um, the section on youth, and um, we had this question um, or something similar last time um, when we did the presentation with the Zimbabwe team, um, and it's about um, how do we take on discussion for in-school and out-of-school young people, so I think this um, might also relate to the age range, so uh, it would be good if you could talk through that a bit, Emma, as well, um, based on the discussions that you've since had with the Zimbabwe team about what that age range should be, um, and whether there have been any um, discussions about how that would work for in-school and out-of-school young people. Okay, uh, I wonder if the question about in-school and out-of-school is perhaps it relating to the questions around ways of sharing messages. So when, when the participants are asked, what about young people in the community, uh, who either who do they admire or what sources of information do they use? That's, that's the first place that young people are mentioned, I think. So there, if being in school or out of school is, is a useful distinction, then it could be useful to, to probe both for young people in school and young people out of school to understand any differences that, that might emerge. Um, the other place that, that we mentioned young people is, of course, in the last section. Here, I'm, it's not so clear to me that the, the distinction between being in school or out of school is necessarily relevant in that we are talking about people, uh, young people, when they become adults. So as Imogen mentioned, we had some discussion uh, with the team in Zimbabwe about what, what that means in practice and decided that it means, first of all, by adults, we will mean anybody who is above 18 and um, in particular, the, the two people who have decided to get married. So by adulthood, we mean both being older than 18 and having um, in this specific case, married and established their own household. So we're asking about the what is envisioned as the household division of labor in that context. So hopefully that that answers the question. But if not, please please do say. Thanks, Emma. Um, we'll see if there's any response to that, um, or if that's clarified things. Um, there's another question. Um, related to the section on aspirations for young people and whether we're only ask getting answers on that question from young people or whether we're also asking adults. 
Yes, um, thank you. This, this question is directed towards all participants. So it's asking participants to collectively uh, set out what the what their aspirations are for young people in the community. Now, the focus group itself will consist of people 18 and older, so there will be some younger people in it, but the idea would be to, uh, would be both to, to uh, get a sense from participants as a whole as to what their aspirations are, but also uh, this, this raises the point that it could be very interesting to see if younger people have any different opinions from older people. And throughout, one of these suggestions is that we note any of these kinds of distinctions. If, if young people are feeling differently from older people, and similarly, if, if women and men express different uh, opinions, uh, and more broadly, the various types of differences or, or cleavages that, that might emerge in the discussion. Thanks, Emma. Um, there's another question um, which is again asking about um, this, the questions around 4C and 4D. So this was um, relating to women or, or girls in the community who don't do the household or care work that's expected of them, um, or households where men or boys take on household tasks or care responsibilities. Uh, and the question is whether these types of questions would raise, um, risk raising um, conflict or intrigue within the community. Yeah, well, two, two thoughts there, thank you. Um, the first is that it would be important to be clear that we're not asking people to identify specific households by name, but rather to talk more generally about whether there are any households, and if so, what are the general characteristics of these households. So it's not a question of identifying specific people or, or um, households. Uh, but more broadly, I think it will be important to, to be guided by, by your uh, insights and experiences into this if, if you feel that, that this will risk causing any, any conflicts, then we should think about how to either reword the question um, or you know, to, to acquire the information in a different way so that, so that we don't have that risk. So in, in that I think it will be very much it will very much be important to be guided by what you think are the likely outcomes. And maybe that's something that can be probed a little bit in the, the piloting of, of the script. OK, I think that's clear. Um, I'm just going to have one last question from Leia before we move on to Leia's presentation. Um, so um, this is a question which we also had last time in the Zimbabwe presentation. Um, so when conducting the focus group discussion, do you suggest that those who attended the RCA and have undergone um, focus group exercise four um, should also attend here? So I think last time um, we said that it might be helpful to have um, one or two people who've been involved in the focus group discussions, but we also um, want to make sure that we have people who um, haven't engaged with this type of work before um, so that we're able to get a broad range of understandings. Okay, I'm going to uh, move on now to Thalia's presentation. Um, let me hand over to you. Have you are you able to unmute? Okay, great. Great, thank you. Um, yes, it's it's good to hear the the questions. Um, these planning steps will be very familiar to people who um, did the rapid care analysis. They're very similar to the guidelines um, about the rapid care analysis. But just to review, um, it is important uh, to take clear decisions about roles, outcomes and outputs, budget and participants to start with. So the roles in planning are um, who's the manager that is commissioning this, um, who, who on the program team um, are going to be working on the planning, uh, who the facilitators are. Uh, clearly, we need at least one man and one woman um, uh, for the, the mixed groups. And you also need a documenter and uh, which partners are going to be working on the planning. Um, on the expected out comes and outputs for the pilot uh, the the two test um, focus group discussions um, we're really looking for comments about the script um, and in fact uh, we want to emphasize this because last time when we um, piloted the training for the RCA we got more about the findings 
of the exercise rather than what the facilitators or other observers thought about what was working well and what didn't and what the recommendations are for modifying the script to make it clearer, to make it more smooth or to make it more insightful. So please uh, make sure that somebody is documenting that on the pilots. And then um, after you've done the full assessments, the, the four to seven um, groups, um, we, we will want a full report on the findings um, how, for the Philippines, but um, we might want to start with a first draft that compiles some findings um, from across the five to seven focus group discussions um, and consult about that, about what is really important to report on? Um, how are you going to synthesize it? What, because we haven't done this before, we'll, we'll need to um, actually come up with an outline for the full report um, that says what is it that we want to make sure is, is highlighted. Uh, on the budget, um, clearly the, the manager is in charge. Um, and that may have implications for how many focus groups, how many facilitators, the travel, the documenter. And on the uh, participants, it's both questions that have just come up about um, who the participants will be and also who will extend the invitations, which partners are going to be working on this. Um, in terms of the next steps, number five, um, how will you ensure the training? We already have uh, a call planned with Emma uh, for um, a couple or a few of you. Um, will you have a, a practice day to practice the exercises? Who will be involved? Um, how will you translate materials and formats into the local language or languages? Um, who will be responsible for uh, the logis logistics and um, how will you manage the documentation and what's the timeline for that. Um, more on logistics, um, clearly there are decisions to be made about which communities and the travel schedule for the facilitators, um, the hours, whether it's better to do it the four hours in the morning or in the afternoon, um, and um, being very um, methodical and, and explicit about who, uh, who the participants are and the invitations. Um, we've had discussions in the um, process of doing rapid care analysis about um, the comfort and privacy of the choice of location and uh, inside or outside um, and making sure that not only food and lunch and transport is um, made available uh, for the participants but also things like childcare and the workshop uh, materials um, and the, for example the consent forms um, taking into um, consideration the literacy levels. Um, we will have a documentation template and um, we need to set up uh, after the piloting a um, meeting to debrief with Emma and Imogen and Anna uh, and then as I was saying before a review of the documentation uh, in a, a early stage, a first draft stage um, so that we can all agree what is it that is going to go into um, a more formal report. I think that's about it. Anything to add, Imogen? No, I don't think so at this point. Um, David, did you mention about um, templates for documentation? And there's a question from Leia about um, whether, similarly to the rapid care analysis, we will have a guide um, for, for documentation. Um, yes, I think we should. <laughs> yes. Um, and I don't, I don't know whether, Emma, could you say what you've worked on so far about this? Yes. No, I was actually in, intending to, to send something prior to the pilot so that part of the piloting could also uh, feedback on whether the template is, is suitable for the reporting. It is on. It may be 
So, okay. Um, so, um, another question about um, facilitators um, and whether we should expect partner staff um, to, to lead as facilitators. And I think um, that's a question um, for you to decide um, partner staff um, can lead these sessions, um, and especially if they have um, good experience of um, doing focus group discussions or being involved in these kinds of activities, um, it would definitely be good um, to have someone who knows the local context, but that's um, a decision that you um, yourselves can make based on the expertise you have in your partner teams. Um, so there's another question about if the focus group discussion has already undergone the rapid care analysis, can we use the results of their rapid care analysis for the exercises, or should we select focus group discussions with members who have not already undertaken the RCA? Um, so yeah, this I think relates to the question that Leah asked earlier. So I think um, we want this. This is a separate exercise, and it goes in much more detail than the rapid care analysis does. So we want predominantly, if not all, people who have not been involved in the rapid care analysis before, or who haven't been involved um, in these kind of activities before, so that we can get a full range um, of views and beliefs um, from those who haven't already been sensitised or involved um, in these kinds of discussions. Um, yeah, so um, as mentioned before, um, you might want to include um, one or two to um, sort of get some interesting discussions going um, and to have um, a range of different views, but we predominantly want people who haven't been involved. Um, so a question about can we have two documenters for the pilot? Um, one for the results and another for the process. Um, yep, yeah, definitely. If you if that would be useful and um, you have that kind of capacity, then that would be really helpful. Um, and then I think the final thing was um, an announcement um, from Leia. So she says that for the budget, she's going to make a budget plan, and um, she'll have a separate discussion on this um, with the with the par partners who are going to be undertaking the rapid care analysis or supporting with that. Um, Leia's also asked for the recording, so I'm going to be sending the recording and a copy of the Q&A session out later, as well as the presentation, because um, Leia's asked for that as well. So um, you'll be able to listen to it again or share it with others who weren't um, able to join today. Uh, I think that's all the questions for now. Um, I'll see if there's any more questions. If you do have any final questions, then do write them in the box now. I'm just going to check whether there are any that I've missed. No, I, think, I think that's everything. And there don't seem to be any more questions coming through. Um, so, it looks like we finished on time, um, in spite of the fact that we started 15 minutes late. Um, so, <laughs> oh yeah, so I just hear from Leia that, um, that we were talking too fast, so maybe that's why we've um, finished a bit early. Um, but as I said, we will be sharing um, the presentation and the recording and the question and answer document, so that should um, help to clear anything up. And if you have any questions that occur to you after this webinar, um, which um, you want to follow up with us afterwards, then please do send an email um, to me or to Thalia, and we can um, liaise with Emma as well and get back to you. As we've mentioned, we will also be having a direct call with those who are going to be um, facilitating and managing the process directly later in the week, um, probably on Friday. So we'll have um, further questions then to go into more detail. But for now, I think Leia's um, also said she's going to send us some, um, some um, direct questions about um, one of her earlier questions. But for now, thanks very much to everyone for joining. Thanks to Emma and to Thalia for their um, very clear presentations and to um, Fazana for supporting us with um, the, the technical support today. And um, we'll, we'll look forward to, um, to hearing from you and um, to hearing the, the results of your, of your pilots. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>